All right. So we'll just talk about the syllabus first for a couple minutes, and then I'll tell you what the course is really going to be about. Because uh, this is just kind of boring crap. Um, so class is kind of weird. So it's a six credit hour class. And what we're going to do is we're going to run the core, the class like we're a startup company. So we're going to be creating a piece of software. Okay? Uh, so we have an in-class project we're going to be working on. And then you're each going to have your own project that you're going to be working on that will mirror our in-class project. It's going to be basically a similar project but a different idea. Something along, along those lines. Um, so the way grades are going to be done in the class, we're going to have a... Uh, you know, several homework assignments. Uh, the class meets every Monday night for four hours uh, for the entire semester. Um, and uh, then you'll have some external research stuff you'll have to do as well uh, because it's six credit hours, so we only have four contact hours a week and that kind of stuff. Uh, we will have a midterm and a final. Uh, each one's going to be worth 20%. The rest of your grade is going to be homework assignments, so these weekly projects, that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so that's basically the grading for the course. Mostly it's going to be homework. Uh, the exams, uh, just like on any of my other classes, if you bomb the midterm and you come back and do well in the final, I'll replace the midterm with your final exam score. So really, uh, but I won't go the other way. So if you do well in the midterm and bomb the final, you can't replace your, <laughs> your final exam score with the midterm. But you get one get-out-of-jail-free card, I guess, on the midterm if you uh, uh, are struggling. Now, having said that, uh, this is going to be kind of a, a weird uh, class because we do kind of have a hybrid approach uh, here where we have some CS people in here and we also have some students from our MSIT program. So um, just so I have an idea, what kind of programming experience have, have you guys had, the ones I haven't had in class? Tell me about programming background. Go ahead, right here. Okay. Well, I um, started off as a football programmer at okay. Okay. Now um, I'm in corporate finance, working on a um, accounts receivable application, and that's basically me, SQL Server. Okay. So, gotcha. So you've done some webby, webby stuff. Yes, I took a job at Flash trying to prepare myself for something that never happened. That's another thing okay. about it. Gotcha. Um, My wife's a COBOL programmer. We got two more people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, yeah, there's one person who hasn't enrolled yet, right? Yeah, yeah, gotcha. All right, so what kind of programming background have you had? Okay, and what kind of stuff have you done with it? So you say you know the basics. Have you made any projects on your own or anything? The reason I'm asking, any answer is acceptable. I'm just trying to figure out where everybody is because in 535, the class you had originally enrolled in, we assume zero programming background. Um, so, so give me an idea on what kind of stuff you've worked on uh, from a programming perspective. Okay, so you would say you have an intermediate grasp of programming, so not a complete beginner, but certainly not advanced. All right, what about you? Okay, so zero. You're you're starting off, but you but you're excited about programming. All right, sound good? Okay. 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 Gotcha. And the rest of the guys I know. Um, okay. So... Let's kind of dive in then. Uh, what we'll probably do is for the first couple of assignments, uh, did I send you the videos for you to start looking at? What I'll probably do is I'll do alternative assignments. Um, and anybody who is going to take the 535 class can do the alternative assignments as well. Uh, but I don't want you to feel like you're at a disadvantage. So I'll have either you can do the, um, the 518 assignment or you can do the 535 version of the assignment. And eventually, everybody will kind of get caught up, and uh, hopefully, you're all going to learn new stuff in here anyways. Uh, but for starters, and as I start going through this, you can uh, 
what I want you to do is maybe start brainstorming what your uh, application idea might be. Um, and because we're going to kind of connect it to what we're uh, uh, looking at here, we'll, uh, we'll brainstorm a little bit about that after we take a break. So we'll probably go for a couple of hours and take like a 15 minute break. And then when we come back from that, uh, maybe we'll spend 15 or 20 minutes kind of talking about if anybody had some ideas for applications that they might want to uh, work on for their project uh, this semester. Um, uh, if, uh, if a project is complex enough, I'd be open to maybe having uh, two people work together on something. But in general, I want us to have uh, separate experiences. So we'll, we'll see kind of what happens. Um, all right, let me just save this real quick. <clears throat> all right, so I'm just going to give you the overview of the application we're going to be making in class. All right, and uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to spend uh, a good portion of today kind of thinking through that and architecting uh, what are the various moving pieces to it? Really trying to understand that problem before we actually figure out how we're going to solve it. All right. Um, so we are, it's a fictitious company. All right. But basically, it's a, we're going to be dealing with the service industry. And the service industry, uh, this company provides um, uh, a couple of services. We do lawn mowing and we do snow removal. All right. So we have a company that's delivering lawn mowing and snow removal. Now, how many of you are familiar with Uber? Most of us are familiar with Uber, the cab driving thing, okay. So this is the Uber of lawn mowing and snow removal. Okay, so the idea is that I have a, uh, uh, you know, big snowstorm's hitting tonight. I'm going to pull out uh, my iPhone or go onto the web, and I'm going to uh, request that my uh, um, uh, snow gets plowed. Okay, my driveway gets cleared. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we're going to have service providers, people who do snow removal. And they're going to have a version of the app just like the Uber drivers have a version of their app. Okay? And they're going to get notified somehow that there's been a request for snow removal and they can accept that snow removal request or not. Make sense? Okay, so we're marrying service providers to consumers who need the service. Uh, and then we need to support payments. So uh, when I type into the app that I want to have my snow removal done, and you agree that you're going to do the snow removal once you come and actually perform the service, at the end you check mark saying I'm done, then I'm going to get charged somehow. These are all things we're going to have to figure out how we're going to implement these things, okay? So I'm going to get charged somehow, and then there's probably going to be some sort of rating system where I can say whether you did a good job, a bad job, whatever, okay? Um, so that's the basic idea for this company. Now we're going to be delivering it through two interfaces. Really long term three interfaces, but we're only going to write one of the one of the other two in here. So we're going to have a web-based interface for this, and we're also going to have a iPhone interface for this. When you work on your uh, own project, you can choose whether you want your you have to have a web-based interface. You can choose whether you want your uh, mobile interface to be iPhone or Android. Okay, um, pretty much everything we talk about with iPhone will apply to Android. So there's plenty of tutorials out there if you're familiar with Java or uh, you don't have a Mac at home or you don't want to come in and work in the Macs in the lab here, you can choose to do your um, mobile application with Android. It's fine. Okay, uh, but our, our example in here will be done with uh, uh, iOS. We have a really nice Mac lab uh, in computer science. So um, they have all the tools on there you'll need to, to work on this. Uh, okay, so any questions about the kind of the, the basic idea of the project we're going to be trying to pull off this semester? Uh, it is Dominic's idea. Yep, so we have a person who's uh, sponsoring the class. So uh, another student here at uh, Concordia who has an idea for this, and he's been pitching me the idea. So I'm like, okay, well, let's write it. So we're going to use it as a in class example and the reason it's nice is because this idea isn't that huge, so we can conceive of the whole thing, but it has a lot of moving pieces. We're going to have to do online payments, so automated payments. We have to do push notifications. Uh, we're going to have to have authentication, so you know, be able to log into the app, that kind of stuff. We're going to have to have some sort of cloud-based database. 
Uh, so lots and lots of stuff that would go into almost any application in industry today. Okay, whether you're in the IT field or you're in the computer science field, we are dealing with a world with a whole bunch of moving parts, right? So what we're talking about here is bringing all these moving parts together into a single application. Uh, on top of that, something you maybe haven't even thought about yet, you know, um, you know initially, the, Dominic, as he pointed out, his original idea is this, this is going to be done in the Chicago area. But, you know, he, he wants it to work any place. Well, so I'm up here in uh, 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 the Milwaukee area. When I say I want to get my snow removed, you know, I don't want uh, my uh, request to go down to a bunch of Chicago people. I want to have a good chance that somebody local is going to pick this up, right? So we're going to have to deal with location services and figure out, you know, uh, who do we display the request to uh, based on where their home address is, where they're currently located, all sorts of things like this. These are the problems we're going to have to grapple, grapple with, okay? Now, the approach we're going to take in class, I want the, um, it's, on one hand, it's nice having a small group because we can kind of do this. How many of you have seen the, uh, the show Silicon Valley? None of you have seen the show Silicon Valley? You know what I'm talking about, though. That was the show that had the joke that we're not going to talk about in here. <laughs> so, premise of Silicon Valley. It's it's a good show. I think is it HBO or is it Showtime? It's on one of the. I think it's HBO. I want to say it's HBO. Premise of this show is uh, there's a startup company, which is a big deal today, right? So uh, you know everybody and their brother has an idea for uh, for an app or some, you know, some sort of technology thing. Uh, even here on campus, where uh, next year we're going to be starting a uh, uh, entrepreneurial center startup company incubator right here on campus. We're building a, a business school, and the computer science department is partnering with them, and we're going to be supporting startup companies here on campus through this new, uh, this new building. Well, so this, the way the show works is, you know, there's like five, know, there's five or six guys, and, you know, they come together, they have a good idea, just like the original Facebook idea, right? Okay, you know, you've seen the, have you seen the movie Social Network? Okay, we'll make that connection. <laughs> okay. All right, so you've seen the movie Social Network. These guys all come together. They have this idea. And now it's a matter of figuring out how do we make this idea, how do we turn it from an idea into a reality? Okay? So what we want to do in here is I want to make this, this class feel like that kind of ecosystem. It's going to be less just me lecturing and more about us working as a group to architect this application. And at the same time, in class here, you're gonna be getting examples of, well, here's this widget that solved this problem for our app. Now you'll be able to say, oh, well, that widget will solve the same kind of problem for your app, okay? So one thing I'd really encourage you to do is as we start going through here, and we'll, like I said, we'll talk after our first break, um, really think about a project that's kind of similar to this for your project. Okay. Um, I mean, if you just want to go gung ho and you want to, you have this idea that you always wanted to implement because you think it's going to be a million dollar idea and you might as well take advantage of a six credit hour class to force you to do it. Fine. <laughs> go for it. But what I'd encourage you to do is think about it more from the perspective of maybe instead of the lawn mowing or snow removal industry, um, you know, maybe you are teaching tennis lessons. Something like that. You know, maybe it's not necessarily on demand like, like an Uber thing, but something similar. Some service where a user is going to sign up for an account, be able to pay somehow, okay, and receive some sort of service in, in, uh, uh, in coming back. Whether it's a, a physical service, whether it's a product, whatever it is, kind of build your idea around that. So the uniqueness, so there, there, let's say there's going to be an 80% similarity between your apps and the app we do in class. It's the 20% that's going to be kind of what you're grappling with outside of class. All right, so try to keep that in mind when you're coming up with an idea as opposed to like, oh, you know, I really want to make an app that will uh, find other solar systems and figure out alien life <laughs> or something like that. Okay. Um, would be cool, <laughs> but might be a little difficult to pull off in uh, um, kind of what we're trying to do in here. Um, okay, <clears throat> so um, having said that, what I want to do is I want to start just kind of brainstorming, drawing some pictures about what this thing is. So, you know, 
all of us bumped into each other at the park today. And I was telling you about this idea, and you were all excited about it. So we decided, you know, let's meet up tonight and let's talk about this. And you know what? We're going to start this company. We're going to make a zillion dollars. That's what we're going to do. That, that's what they do in the show. Okay? And then it's, it's funny. They do. They get funding and all. It's, it's good. You should watch the show. It's a good show. Um, all right. So let's kind of draw a picture here. Now, one thing I like to start off with when we are... Um, thinking about an application. Uh, whether we're writing software or we're just solving a problem in real life, uh, if we were building a shed in real life, let's say, building a house, building a shed, whatever, um, we might ask ourselves, well, who's going to use this shed? And how are they going to use it? Right? So we want to think about this idea of something called use cases. All right. So if you've ever had a software engineering type class or something like that, uh, you maybe have heard this phrase before. Fancy way of saying who's going to use the application and how are they going to use the application. So we want to get that idea. Okay. So in our application here, we really have three use cases. We have the person who wants their snow removed or their lawn mowed. Okay. So we're going to call that the consumer. Then we have the person who's going to do the snow removal or the lawn mowing. So that's the service provider. And finally, we have the business owner. So in this case, Dominic, uh, or in your case, you. Okay, the person who's going to ultimately get paid. All right? Because consider, when I'm a consumer and I'm paying her to do the snow removal, the business owner who provided this awesome, Uber-esque uh, application for making this happen probably gets a cut, right? So Dominic, this uh, guy sitting over here, He's going to take whatever it is, 10%, some, some cut of that transaction all right, for providing that, uh, that thing in the middle. All right, so we have the owner. So these are three different use cases for this application. And we want to really think about initially at the high level, and then we'll get more granular from there. So initially, we're really going to talk about this app in various iterations from so our first pass here is, what does each of these different users need to be able to do with the application as a whole? Then we want to think about the various ways we're going to deliver these features. Okay, we've already talked about there needs to be two interfaces. For us, it's going to be a web-based interface, and then there's going to be an uh, iPhone interface. And we probably should make sure that web-based interface is mobile-friendly, right? For those Android people who can't use the iPhone app. Ideally, we would have an iPhone and an Android, but that's kind of double dipping in here, so why focus on two separate, let's call it similar interfaces, kind of the same thing. Um, okay, so let's talk about our consumer use case. What are the things that our consumer needs to be able to do with this application? Okay, so right off the bat, they need to request, they need to be able to pick the service they want. Okay, so they're, I'm essentially, if I'm the consumer, I'm shopping for, for, uh, for something. I'm either going to the store for lawn service or snow removal. Okay, so pick lawn service, snow removal. So that's something they need to be able to toggle, whether the application is in lawn mode that is, connect me with uh, lawn mowing people, or it's in snow removal mode, connect me with snow removing people. In the real world, sometimes those people are the same people, but we certainly don't want to call a snow removal company if we want our yard mode. Might get messy with the shovels and stuff like that. Okay, what else? <clears throat> Ah, we need to be able to pay. So we need to be able to pay for the service. Somehow, we're keeping this real generic right now. Okay, what else? Go ahead. Okay, so um, are you talking about geographically where they're located or like maybe how much, how big their yard is? Okay, so... You know, like my house has a certain size driveway. My neighbor might have a bigger or smaller driveway than me. So I have to have some way of, of uh, um, advertising how big the job is, right? Like, 
Okay, no, but this, that, that becomes kind of the issue with this, though, is, is there isn't going to be a first time they come out. This is a real-time thing. So when the service provider gets a request, they're agreeing to do this for a price. Okay, so our business, the owner's business, will set a price for this, just like Uber. So if you've used Uber before, you say, this is, you know, I need to be picked up here, and you say where you want to go, and it gives you the price. Okay. So when the driver accepts that, he's accepting to take you there for that price. And that's, that's a contract. Okay? So at the very least, there needs to be an, uh, a, a, a good way of estimating. You don't want to tell them that I have a uh, tiny driveway and then they get there and it's a church parking lot. Okay? <laughs> and by parking lot, I mean uncovered parking garage. <laughs> so... Um, so in any case, uh, that's maybe where the review system comes in. If somebody lies about their yard, uh, then, you know, whatever. But at the very least, we need to have a way of advertising how big our yard is, how big the driveway is, uh, whether or not we need sidewalks done. So at some point, there's probably going to be like an uh, a, a extras field. You know, I think that's coming to mind right now is like when you order a pizza online, um, there's like a, an extra like description box for like special delivery instructions. You know, like there's a killer dog behind the fence, uh, go on the left sidewalk or something like that. All right. So we need to have some way for them to describe the size of the job. And realistically, we probably want to attach that to like a profile or something. Because, you know, every single time you want to request snow removal, you don't want to have to go in and re-enter in all the information about your house. That should kind of be part of your account. Right. Okay. So how big the job is, I need to be able to pay for the service. I need to be able to pick the kind of service. That I want. Okay, so part of how big it is, where 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 am I located? Set my location. Okay, I need to be able to provide feedback after the service. So I've come into the, the thing, I've set up my account somehow to pay, I have picked my type of service, I've described how big my house is in terms of driveway or yard or whatever, I, I've described where my house is located, um, last thing to do is to do what? Okay, um, that's interesting. So certainly I need to request the service, right? So the question is, is that does part of that request include when you want it done? Like, is it include a specific time? Or is it like a after this time and before this time? Yeah, yeah. So is it... Uh, Well, right. I'm almost thinking, do you, like, if I'm if I'm the consumer and I'm requesting this, I'm kind of saying, you know, oh, we're supposed to get eight inches of snow tonight. I need my I need the snow plowed tomorrow. Snow's supposed to stop at eight a.m. So anytime after eight a.m. and before midnight or something like that, you know, like not not like a tight window. I, I guess I'm I'm thinking because you. You know, you don't want to make it too granular because you want there to be a good chance that your your job's going to get picked up. And I was so I suppose if it's that big of a deal um, that it's like instantaneously done, somebody would probably have like an on call snow removal place. But if you're trying to do like the the Uber of snow removal, it's like hey, you know, snow's got to be removed within 24 hours or I get fined by my homeowners association. Anytime after 8 a.m. tomorrow and before midnight's good. Get it done, <laughs> and I'll pay for the service. Okay, so so some way of providing a range, um, but not too granular. So let's just say request service with a rough range of time, but not too 
granular. I think that's fair enough. Okay, so we're going to have to conceive upon an interface that makes sense for that. All right. Anything else the consumer needs to be able to do? Okay, so <clears throat> so one thing the consumer needs to be able to do potentially is a, is apply a promo code. Okay, so somebody else has got to give them a promo code, but um, let's put that in as a as like a maybe type thing. Um, optional um, apply promo code. What's going through my mind right now is. That's not a bad idea, but maybe not a version one idea. You know, like it's it's something that certainly would help the business, but is it a necessary feature for the tool to work initially? Because something we're shooting for here is something called a um, an MVP. That's a minimum viable product. So we're trying to come up with what is the minimum product that will accomplish what we're trying to accomplish without having so many bells and whistles that we can't get it done in the amount of time we need to get it done. Make sense? So that means some of these features that, yeah, it would be awesome, you know, like Uber, that's the, probably the reason that got me into using Uber. I think I took my first like six rides with Uber for free. <laughs> you know, whoever you're with, you just have them sign up for the new account and that's the, you get a free ride. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that, that certainly worked on Uber and now, you know, it's convenient. So no, any city I'm in that has Uber, I use Uber instead of a, instead of a cab. So it works out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the only thing I'm thinking about is like, say we do the lawn, the lawn service part. I just know I think that this is the, the app is more reasonable for it, but the lawn care, I mean, what prevents them from saying, hey, can you do this at the weekend? Oh, what, what prevents yeah. the, uh, well, I, I think that would maybe be something that's in the terms. Um, so, you know, you, you're going to have unethical people, right? So you're going to have people that bypass that. I don't think you can really police it. Okay. Um, so somewhere when, I, when a provider, I mean, that's something we need to think about from the provider's perspective. So if we think about an Uber driver, for example, you know, Uber has a way of training their drivers, making sure they pass, the, you know, get insurance and all this stuff. So when you're an Uber driver, you agree to a whole bunch of stuff, right? So that makes them liable if something, if they breach that agreement. So the idea would be if uh, the lawn care person did the person's lawn once for them and then created, you know, on the side, a weekly thing to do it with them, potentially they've opened themselves up to legal troubles. Realistically, you're probably not going to hunt down somebody who, who stole one the one uh, provide you know one service thing from you. But you know the uh, the punchline would be that the, the hope is is that service providers like this because they don't have to promote their business; they just have to provide the service. Um, kind of a problem, and that's really been the, the the kind of the new thing. That's the kind of the Uber Uber uh, way of things is that there are plenty of people that know how to drive a car. It's a much harder job to find somebody to give a ride to. Uber connects people who can drive a car to people who need a ride. So Uber handles that business connection piece. And then the service providers can provide their service. So somebody who does snow removal, who does lawn removal, or, or lawn uh, uh, mowing, this person very well might appreciate uh, being able to just open up the app and say, oh, I'm going to go mow some yards. Or I'm going to go clear some uh, snow. In fact, what you're probably going to end up having is the, a, a majority of the people using this uh, app from a service provider perspective are likely not going to be your big professional outfits that already have built up businesses, right? It's going to be people who like, oh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll mow five yards a week. Or I'll go and you know, do snow. I have a snow blower. Why not go and do uh, a snow removal around uh, you know, my town? something like that for a couple hours a week, get some spending cash. So it'll be people like that. Similarly, you know, the people who are driving Uber, uh, Uber cars, they're not your people who've been driving taxis for 30 years. Now you got taxi drivers that are doing some Uber stuff as well. But, you know, it started off at the very least as people were like, oh, I could make a little bit extra money by driving some people around. Especially, I, I know there's a bunch of students here at Concordia 
who drive for Uber and take advantage of special events. So when there's a big uh, concert or something like that down uh, downtown, they drive. When there's a Bucks game or a Brewers game, they, they, they drive those days. What they don't do is they don't go and drive just randomly on a Wednesday night. They wait till there's an event. <laughs> and then they go on the clock because they can get good money in a compressed period of time. All right? As opposed to a taxi driver where it's your job to be out there driving and sometimes you get fares, sometimes you don't. Okay, so let's think about the service provider use case. <coughs> what does a service provider need to be able to do? Okay, they need to be able to accept a job. Okay. Um, complete a job, say transactionally. Okay. Do we rely on the app to provide that? Or can we rely on the service provider to have their own GPS or something like that? Well, you also don't want to solve a problem that you can't solve well. So can we provide directions better than Google Maps can provide directions? Or Garmin GPS or something? Probably not. So it would probably be in our best interest to, especially in a, in a mobile app uh, situation, uh, it would be in our best interest to just give them a click the clickable address that will automatically open it up in their GPS app, right? So we've eff effectively provided the, the, the feature but didn't have to write the feature. Okay. Um, so let's say clickable address to open their favorite GPS app. What else? Okay, so I need to be able to see. Well, I'm, from, I'm, I'm a service provider, so I'm going to see a list of, of jobs that have not been accepted. So these are our first come, first serve, right? Um, so I'm basically saying whether or not I'm willing, I, I'm, I'm basically saying, can I commit to doing this job or not? And whoever grabs the job gets, gets the job but now they've committed themselves to completing it. Uh, so they're gonna see when it has to, you know, when it, can't, when it can start being done and when it has to be done by, you know, that window. And, you know, we can maybe, that was what we said on the other screen, we can maybe set that as a minimum of an eight hour window or, or something like that, or we can even just hard code it to end of day, that day, after 8 a.m. to midnight. Maybe that's just the default. Um, but it's basically a race to pick up the, the person. Yeah. Okay, so, so so be able to basically ex set up a profile in terms of what services they provide. Okay, fair enough. Okay. What happens if the service provider really only needs me to accept the job because something happens and I can't make it? So okay. if they needed something to back out of the job or say, I don't. Yeah, it's. Uh, one thing that would be worthwhile for us to do is get one of the uh, Uber drivers from here on campus to come and tell us how it works on the Uber driver side of things. Um, uh, 
But in general, I, I know there's communication that happens between the Uber driver and the end user because they can send me a text message. All this can happen through the app. Um, so I would assume that there would need to be um, some sort of messaging uh, thing that would effectively release the job. You know, oh, I apologize. I'm not going to be able to do it by this period of time. Um, yeah, yeah, whatever. I mean, obviously things are going to happen, right? Uh, so the question is, is that part of the MVP? Is it, is it what actually has to be done? Or is that something that we know needs to be dealt with at some point? But, and, and this is kind of an important thing with software development is uh, I tell people don't try to solve all the world's problems day one. Um, if you come up with every little thing that might go wrong, you'll never finish the product. Uh, so we, um, well, certainly that's vi that, that's valid, and it's very likely that's going to happen. One thing from a business owner's perspective is we're going to have to see how often is that a problem, and how did we deal with that problem. So I met with Dominic this morning, and one of the things we kind of talked about is um, for some of the resolution type stuff is it might just be on him as a person initially, where you know, the, the you know, maybe we do a, a, a simple little email type thing saying, I can't make it or whatever, and then let him do, you know, resolution for, for that. Whether the person gets a credit for another service provider to make it right or, you know, whatever it is. But we should certainly at least uh, mark it here. Um, um, cancel a service. Due to emergency, somehow that needs to be covered somehow. Whether it's a kind of an initial ghetto solution to it, followed by an elegant solution later on, whatever. Okay, what else? Get paid. <laughs> okay. I don't think we're going to keep very many service providers on here unless they can get paid. All right, so we need to figure out how to get these guys paid. Um, this is actually going to be a very, a really interesting part of this application, is how does a consumer pay to the cloud? And then how does the service provider get paid out? And how does this guy up here keep his cut? How does that all get automated? All right, and that, what's nice about this approach is, wouldn't you say that there are a million different businesses that require that exact model. So if we can solve that model generically here, essentially we have a platform that we can apply, whether we're doing haircuts, lawn mowing, uh, doing somebody's nails, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever it is. We have all sorts of things. These are all things that need to have you know, uh, money moving from one place to another. And we're going to have to look into various technologies that can do this and pick one and have a reason why we're picking that one. Okay? All right, so we need to get paid. All right, so I'm a service provider. I go on here. I'm able to accept the job. Um, when I accept a job, there's probably going to be a, uh, uh, maybe we ex expand this and say review and accept a job. We need to find out something about the job we're accepting, right? You know, am I accepting a, uh, a job to do a small driveway or am I accepting a job to plow a church parking lot? Either one are, are valid clients for this application, but they're probably going to have different price tags associated with it, right? Go ahead. Okay. Register, authenticate. <clears throat> and maybe for service provider, register, apply, authenticate. Do we just take any service provider? Probably depends on the service, right? But in this, at the very least, there should be some sort of oversight. I mean, even if it's just an, you know, some sort of validation on, you know, 
like where they actually live or, or something like that. You know, just some sort of way that you can guarantee you can contact that service provider in the event that, you know, there's been a problem, something like that. Okay, so something we need to consider. What does it mean to apply uh, for this? Maybe initially, maybe in version one, um, that's something that kind of happens on the, uh, uh, you know, more on the human side. You know, maybe they apply and that effectively has them fill out a, a job application that ultimately goes to Dominic, who then calls the person back and there becomes a phone interview type thing um, instead of being some sort of automated process. Not every process can be automated. In fact, um, when you're, especially when you're dealing with MVPs, the processes that are most important to be automated are which processes? So in, in this, if we think about this application, this world, which processes are the most important ones that need to be automated? Yeah, the consumer facing portion. Okay. Secondarily, it would probably be the service provider. And then the last one would be the owner. Okay. You know, if the owner has uh, some manually moving parts in the background, that's probably okay. The same. And what we just said there is probably true for how good the app needs to look too. It needs to look the best for the consumer who's requesting services. Okay. At the very least, it needs to be easy to use for the service provider. That probably trumps, um, you know, how good it looks. And then for the admin, the owner, doesn't really matter as long as he's getting paid. Right? <laughs> it just needs to work. It needs the function on the back end. All right, so and so you've been in industry doing this stuff. You've seen that the admin stuff doesn't look anywhere near as good as the, the consumer-facing stuff. Why spend time and money on an interface that nobody's going to see except for the developers or, you know, the people that are just running a report or something like that? Okay, what else? Okay, so kind of going back over to this side. Um, so maybe what you're saying is less about backing out, but more. Yeah. Right. And then obviously then they think that that user could get punished with like probation type thing. And if they do something else bad, they get terminated. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a couple things. So one thing I, I think a consumer should be able to do is maybe if they have a service provider come out and do a job <coughs> and they're not happy with it, they can mark that as a person they don't want to have be able to accept their job again. Um, so maybe be able to... Um, Block poor providers. Okay, so that's going to be a consumer uh, use case. And we already say they need, yeah, here's the provide the feedback. So maybe as part of the feedback, um, why don't we put that as part of the feedback? Block this provider. So when you're putting in the feedback of the person did a crappy job, there's probably a, a couple of levels of crappy job, right? There's one level of crappy job, like, okay, well, they did it. They cleared the snow. They didn't do a great job. Probably don't want them to come back, but I'm not going to complain about it beyond that. I'm not going to go and start asking for my money back. I just don't really want this guy to come out and do it again. That's one level. Then there's, I need to escalate this and bitch to somebody that, that this wasn't done right and I want my money back and I need it redone or something like that. Um, so we need to have a couple of uh, uh, things there. So maybe we have the block the provider there um, and then maybe this is open a incident report, something like that, that you remind us what needs to kind of happen there. Even if that ends up for us just being an email to the admin 
explaining what happened <laughs> and then letting it become just leveraging just email and phone calls from there instead of it actually happening through the app. Uh, it certainly needs to be something that the user needs to be capable of doing. What about on the other end, the other side of the coin? Should a service provider um, be able to rate a consumer? How about the accuracy of how they presented them, themselves? Yeah. Or like the, the job size you mean? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I see. Yeah, they, they said this was a uh, medium-sized driveway, and I got there, and it was a church parking lot. Because <laughs> then I think that necessarily portrays the dot that you have them, like, reevaluated. Okay. So rather yeah, than... They should, they should obviously be getting paid more for that because I mean, it's a larger job than you've set up a company. Okay, and, and let the admin mitigate. So rather than service providers rating consumers, because from their perspective, they're just getting money. Money gets dumped into their account somehow, right? So rather than that being the way it works, uh, we would say, let's go ahead and have a uh, um, service provider uh, be able to, you know, pretty much the same thing we did over here, uh, open an incident report. Okay. I think that makes pretty good sense. And that incident report very well might lead then to Dominic going in and contacting consumer and having them modify their, you know, what they're saying their house is. And like, you know, this guy says your driveway is uh, three miles long. <laughs> yeah, but it's only one lane. <laughs> My brother has one of those. My brother has this giant farmhouse and he's got a driveway that's like a mile long. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to play. I think the tractor plows it. Um, all right. Anything else the service provider needs to be able to do? At least our first pass. One thing we already saw here, we, we, we already went back and made a couple of incremental updates to the, the previous screen, right? So this is kind of a living, uh, living document type thing. Okay. So now let's talk about the admin use case. What does the admin need to be able to do? Okay. Sign up service providers. What else? Get paid. Do the consumers need to be able to get paid? <laughs> the consumer, why is everybody getting paid except the consumers? Okay, so, uh, um, Let's see, how would we say that? How about provide formula for estimating cost? We'll figure out what that means. <clears throat> I know something Dominic mentioned is that uh, there's a similar app for at least snow removal uh, that measures driveway size in terms of how many cars would fit in the driveway. Uh, how many cars wide, how many cars long. So, you know, if it's a six car driveway, that gives you a pretty decent idea on what the size of that driveway is with, you know, within reason, right? It's close enough. Well, yeah, we say usually, but cars, we all have this concept in our head when I say a car. If I said that this driveway could hold six cars, do we all have a pretty good idea about how big that driveway is in the big scheme of things? I mean, we're probably not going to be able to throw a square foot number to it, but you're going to probably say that's like a medium-sized driveway, six cars. 
10 cars, kind of a larger driveway, two cars, pretty small driveway. We, you know, we have, that's giving us a, a pretty decent idea that if we're a service provider, we kind of know what we're getting into, right? And that's what's kind of most important in this case is the service provider needs to be able to evaluate the job he's being asked to do and the amount of money that he would get paid for it and ultimately be able to accept it. And sometimes square foot doesn't give us everything we need. Because you might have one of those really funky shaped driveways that has a certain square footage. Um, but because of that driveway, it's like, you know, it, you have to hand shovel three quarters of it or something like that. Um, I'm not sure the car thing helps with that either. But, you know, the, I don't think exact measurements is all that important. You know, I think if two driveways are both roughly medium size, those are probably going to be the same price. I don't think we want to have these like granular numbers like, well, technically this driveway was 38 cents more to plow than this one. You know, <laughs> I think you want to have these ballparky uh, type numbers. Um, something else just kind of came to mind. I don't know if uh, this is a real thing or not. It would certainly be something to, to ask um, Dominic would be this idea that some people want their uh, driveways only uh, hand shoveled or uh, snow blown. They don't want the truck with the shovels because it tears up yards and stuff like that. Ah, yeah, salt. Well, we just say extras, salt, etc. Something like that. That'll at least clue us into having to consider it later on. Okay, so an admin needs to be able to sign up service providers. They need to be able to get paid. They somehow have to get information in for estimating cost. <clears throat> what else? Okay. Okay, so, like, be able to, like, kick people out? Okay, so, if the, so, kind of read user feedback. Okay. So we got to decide how, do you just... And is that done through the admin panel, or is that more of a manual thing? Because there's going to be different ways of handling it. So, for instance, say uh, um, you might have a consumer say, well, the job was done, but they tore up my yard, let's say. Well, they don't want somebody to come back out and plow again. They got the snow gone. They also got a half of my yard gone, <laughs> gone, gone with it. Um, so they're complaining and then the admin needs to be able to do something, but is that something that the admin panel, if you will, needs to be able to provide, or is this something that the admin would do kind of on the business side of things and say, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and refund this consumer this, or I'm going to give them a credit on their account for their next service or, or something like that. And then the argument, well, with their yard being torn up forever, if they say they want their yard Yeah. Um, because then you can't, if it's not marked, you can't really be upset that that could happen. Right. At some, at some point, we probably need to, and this would be more on the owner side of things, you know, from a liability perspective, there probably needs to be some sort of agreement that the consumer enters into um, about what's considered reasonable or, or, or something like that. So we can certainly add it to the list.
maybe agree to a liability statement, something like that. Same thing with the service provider. So that would be something that, you know, the owner would have some sort of lawyer write up a contract or something like that, and the people would agree to it, whether it's policeable or binding or whatever that's not on the app. That's, we put it in front of you, you agree to this, we don't know if we can force this on you or not, but it's, it's not the app that's doing it. It's, we just have to have them, they have to have a way of seeing it and agree, hitting a checkbox or something like that. Okay, so we have contact consumer and service provider. Okay, so like a report, run reports. Okay. Okay, so... Um, so the transaction details are going to be somewhere in the reports, but maybe you, you something like uh, manage um, consumer. So why don't we just say manage accounts? Um, and transaction records. And manage accounts might be like reset passwords. Um, say etc for right now not sure we can necessarily throw a whole bunch more in there than that okay what else yourself in the shoes of the admin. The admin sits down the computer, they log in, they should be able to see run reports, see the transactions that have happened today, weekly, monthly, how much have I made, how much, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. So kind of a business at a, business at a glance. Uh, they should be able to put service providers into the system manually. Um, they should be able to somehow get paid. You know, chances are the system's going to automatically put money into an account that they have linked somehow, but maybe they're able to link the account either through the admin panel or maybe it's just part of the implementation. Um, they should be able to do a uh, contact uh, type thing, whether that is just going into the system and getting contact information for email and phone numbers and then contacting them through their own systems, whether you know they just send an email or they make a phone call as opposed to the admin side allowing, you know, providing them a contact form or something. Um, but at the very least, they need to be able to get that contact information. Um, manage accounts like resetting passwords, things like that. Anything else? Okay. Consumer interfaces. So we've talked about how the consumer is going to use the application. Now we need to talk about the various interfaces through which they can use the application. So we said iPhone and web, right? Okay, so those are gonna be the interfaces for the consumer. What about service provider? So maybe maybe mobile only. So is the service provider just an iPhone application? Maybe we even say iPhone and then put a question mark on Android. If we have time. 
but is it reasonable to say that the service provider is experiencing this whole service through just the mobile device? Because that's what they have with them when they're out there and they complete a task, right? When they finish uh, um, plowing a, a driveway, they need to be able to mark that job as being complete. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, Dominic mentioned is maybe take a picture of the driveway when it's done. And, you know, that's part of the completion process. You know, so if we kind of go back here, um, where was it? Complete a job transactionally, you can say maybe with a picture. You know, I'm not sure how much that necessarily helps, but it could add a level of accountability. Um, but it also adds a level of storage. Now you got to store these images somewhere because it takes up space. That's going to cost money. So is it worthwhile? Uh, and also, how does, you know, something we're going to have to tackle is how does a consumer, um, you know, if the consumer requests the job, the service provider performs the job, but that says, I'm done. Does, is that it? Or does the consumer have to then accept that it's done? You know, how many moving parts do you have in order to make this work? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, with Uber, the consumer doesn't get to agree that the job is done. You know, if the ride's done, I don't even, there's no checkout process. I automatically get charged. So it's super convenient, uh, but if I had a bad experience, I can go back in and I can complain or something uh, through the Uber app. But in terms of, you know, thinking about this from the perspective of Uber, we want to keep it as simple as possible, as few moving parts as possible. And sometimes that might mean making certain assumptions or assuming the, you know, how ethical somebody might be, something like that. All right, so service provider, maybe mobile only. Can we, can we make an alternative argument? Is there an argument why we might need to have a web-based interface for a service provider? Okay, so even though the phone is what's really going to be necessary for completing a job uh, on the road, or at least would be most convenient, I suppose they could just wait till they get home and mark a job off as complete. Uh, if they're at home, having a web interface for accepting jobs might be more convenient. Well, I think the idea here is these are single person providers or small, you know, small providers. You know, it might be a group of two or three guys that are all agreeing to do, you know, do something under a single account or something like that. But, <sighs> but I think it's still a single, single user type thing. All right. So, so web, since they might accept jobs at home, something like that. You can make an argument that web makes sense. Uh, on the flip side, you also have um, uh, service providers who maybe don't have uh, iPhones or Android phones. Uh, I've run into this, uh, I have a, a buddy of mine who's like a general contractor. You know, I, I would assume that some of the folks that do snow removal and lawn maintenance stuff are also general contractor-ish type skill sets, and these guys don't like the touchscreen phones. They want physical, uh, physical phones because the, the touch they can't use a touchscreen phone when their hands are all greasy and stuff like that. Um, so, if our service providers might not have a phone that's compatible with this, we have to give them a web interface so that when they get home, they can actually, you know, maybe they just print out the dresses they're supposed to go to. That's just how they do things. Maybe it seems kind of weird to technologists, but you also want to, I mean, the service providers are a very important uh, uh, you know, piece to this puzzle. If they're not going to show up to provide the service, then the whole business fails, right? 
Okay, so I think web uh, makes sense. You might accept jobs at home and might not have. job work conditions all right and then admin interface what's the interface for the admin just web I mean, while it might be nice to have a, a iPhone interface for this or something like that, you know, down the road, certainly in order to, from a minimum viable product perspective, um, you know, the admin needs really a minimalistic uh, admin interface, whatever the bare bones minimum is to keep, keep all this glued together. Okay. So we've talked about the use cases. We've talked about the interfaces. Well, let's draw a picture. We want to kind of get a, uh, a pie in the sky view of what this ecosystem is going to look like. So we can start seeing what servers and databases and things like that we're going to need to pull this off. So these are our consumers. We'll have three consumers there, let's say. And then we're going to have service providers. And service providers will be a different color. All right, then we have our one admin. Right. And we already said that our consumers would have web <coughs> and iPhone. Decided our service providers would have web and iPhone, and we decided our admin would have web for our interfaces. Okay, now if we're going to have web, that means we need to have a web server somewhere, somewhere where these web pages are being hosted. Okay. So this is our web server, or HTTP server, okay? So this guy is going to be the back end for these three interfaces. So this is going to be our admin web. This is going to be our service provider web. This is going to be our consumer web. Go ahead and line those up there. All right. So these interfaces live on that web server and are viewed through a web browser. Okay. These other interfaces live on the cell phone that's being carried around by the consumer or the service provider. 
Okay, so now we talked about registering for accounts and uh, signups and things like that. Uh, so that means we need to be able to handle user authentication and that kind of stuff. So we're going to need a database of some kind, something to hold user accounts. All right, so there's our database. We don't know the nature of that guy yet, but we have some sort of database that's going to hold this stuff. Okay. Now, each of these little squares, this admin is a person. These are three people. Here's three more people. So these are our users in our system. Okay. The circles are our interfaces, and then the other stuff are the, are the other stuff. Okay, so now when a consumer makes a request either through their web interface or their iPhone, that request then needs to show up to this guy. So either the service provider's phone or the service provider's web. They need to become aware. So there needs to be some sort of a communication that exists between these two interfaces and oh, I need to change the color of this. And these two interfaces. And vice versa. So when a service provider clicks and says, okay, I'm accepting this job, the consumer then needs to become aware that, oh, I, I don't have to worry anymore. Somebody's going to be doing the snow removal. Okay. All right, so we have a web server somewhere here that's hosting web pages. Now, these web pages, some of these are going to be static web pages. Some of these are going to be dynamic web pages. That is, uh, some of these web pages, as uh, new jobs come in, are going to be updated to show additional jobs, new stuff showing up on the screen, that kind of stuff, right? All right, so we're going to have to have uh, some sort of dynamic technology behind the scenes here. So we're not going to be talking about just straight uh, HTML and CSS pages. We're going to be talking about some sort of dynamic technology, whether it's a PHP or a Ruby server or a Python, whatever, something, something on the website that, that allows us to do dynamic stuff. All right. So that's one question that we need to answer. So here's some questions we need to talk about. Let's just go this route. So which dynamic web tech? Then we need to talk about which database tech. It's like freezing rain or something? It's raining on my way here. All right, so which database tech? Uh, our, our, our hands are going to be pretty much tied when it comes to which iPhone tech. All right, so at least that's one less question we have to answer. All right. Um, so we have web interfaces. We're going to answer that question. We have this. We're going to answer that question. The actual web server is relatively insignificant. We can, act, we can answer the question, but... It's relatively insignificant. Um, we probably need to ask the question, where do we host our web server? Okay, uh, a couple things we didn't put in here um, that kind of popped into my head here. Let's go service provider, use case. This guy needs to be able to receive push notifications slash emails 
etc., some sort of communication, and you'd be able to get information that something new is is available. You know, bring their attention to the app so they can go and open it. Same thing with the consumer. Receive push notifications, emails, etc. Okay. So, let's start talking about a couple of these. Um, so, some of you in here have had some uh, um, web background stuff. So, we are having tryouts now for which dynamic web technology we might use. That is, what thing... Just let me let me let me give like a five minute spiel on this. So for for those of you who haven't had web stuff before, um, just so we're all on an equal playing field. If it's a review for you, great, take a nap. All right, so we have our web server. Well, actually, let's let's just say server for right now. I want to take this at a relatively remedial level and then <coughs> exaggerate it from there. And then we have our client. Okay? So this is plain Jane networking stuff. We have a client and a server. Client talks to the server, just like at McDonald's. I walk in and want a Big Mac. I talk to the person at, behind the register, tell them I want a Big Mac. They serve me a Big Mac. All right? We negotiate. I give them some cash. The Big Mac comes over cost, blah, blah, blah. So that's the client-server model. Now, in our world, right now, um, we're, we're talking about the web side of this, right? So forget about iPhone for a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it back in here uh, in a little bit. But in our world right now, our client is going to be a web browser. Okay? That's our client. Our server is going to be a web server. Fine. Now, just like I just used the McDonald's example a few minutes ago, or a minute ago, whatever it was, this web server is going to serve something to our web browser. What kinds of content do web browsers know how to handle? What, is a, what does a web browser understand? What must the content from the web server that it's what must the web server serve the web browser? HTML. What else does a web browser understand? CSS? XML? Yeah, fair enough. I'm going to come back to the XML thing on the next screen. Oh, I'm glad we did this thing. That's pretty much it. Web browsers know how to process HTML, CSS, JavaScript. All right, let's talk about those for a few minutes. Um, this is good. Being able to work in a group like this, I'll be able to kind of see where our understanding is and misunderstanding is and how much some of you have forgotten. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see here. What was it talking about? Oh, that's right. What is HTML? Okay, that's what it stands for. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. But what is it? What kind of animal is it? Is it a programming language? Data representation language. Okay, this is a data representation language. All right, so what's its purpose? What's the purpose with... I mean, so that, that sounds like a fancy-ish phrase, but what is, what is the purpose of a data representation language? Might it be to represent data? 
when would we want to represent data? If I go to uh, msn.com, that's Microsoft's portal page, right? So lots of content on that page, I think. Should be able to see lots of stuff, news stories, things like that. There is a whole bunch of information that's being spit out at me on that page. Now that information came from a source. So this web server provided that information to the web browser. Now that web server might have gotten that information from someplace else. We don't know where it got the information from. But ultimately, it gathered all the information, just like the person at McDonald's. You know, you don't know where they got the meat or the burgers or anything like that from. But they, they took your order, they went back and gathered a bunch of stuff, and they threw a burger at you, right? Okay? So, web server somehow got all the information you requested and shoves it out at you, and it comes to you in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. All right? Now, a big chunk of that is going to be HTML. Okay? HTML is a language for organizing data, all right? Because this web browser needs to work generically. It needs to be able to handle data coming from all sorts of different sources. Now, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of different internet sources, right? Okay, well, if each one of them chose a different way of representing your, their data, would our web browser stand a chance of, uh, being able to give us the experience that we have today? Or can we pretty much go to any web page and have a pretty good idea on how the information is going to be displayed to us? Some pages are prettier than others, but there's a pretty good standard across the, across the, the bar, uh, across, across the web, right? Okay, HTML is that standard, it's that glue. Every single web page we ever go to is going to start off as having the core data represented in HTML. Okay, and HTML is a tag-based language which organizes data. Okay, so for example, if I wanted to put a, uh, a bold header uh, text on my web page, I would say this is going to be H1 it's going to be bold, it's going to be hello world, there's my closing bold tag, there's my closing header tag. Okay, That's the generalistic format of HTML. Make sense? Okay, so it's a tag-based language. Um, all right, now you mentioned something about XML. Tell me about that. What's that guy? Okay. Okay. Can you give me an example of a parent child tag type thing in XML? Maybe let me ask it a different way. What's Does XML look different than HTML? Okay, in what way? Are HTML and XML the same? Are they the same kind of thing? Or are they completely different things? They are the same? Okay, almost the same. Anybody else? Is XML a language? I'm not asking you if it's a programming language. I'm asking you if it's a language. You told me it stood for extensible markup language, right? Is it a language? Sure. Well, certainly the name implies it is, right? Okay. 
what is it a language for? So if we assume XML is a language, what are we supposed to do with that language? What is its utility? Well, which came first, XML or HTML? HTML came first. Why do we need XML? We already had something the browsers could read. Could read. So what problem is HTML solving? But what problem is it solving? Why, why does HTML exist? We just talked about it here, right? HTML exists so that we can organize data in an appropriate way that a web browser could understand it. So HTML is the agreed upon language that web browsers and web servers have chosen to speak. That's how they, you know, just like I'm speaking to you in English, that's the language we agreed upon when I walked through the door and said I only speak English. <laughs> so that, that became the default. Um, um, so this is the agreed upon language. What is the job of XML? We want to understand. So, you know, we're, 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 we're the startup company. We met the park today. We're about to decide all these like really important things about how we're going to design our application. We can all agree there's all these buzzwords that float around out there, right? We want to make sure we're not confused on stuff before we just start making, uh, making decisions. What problem does XML exist to solve? What is its utility? What problem would you say that, oh, I know how we could solve that. We can use XML to solve that. Google in it, Chris, here. XML is a language for defining data representation languages. That's what XML is for. For example, we could use XML to define HTML. In fact, they've done it. It's called XHTML. All right? And most web browsers have a feature that you can turn on XHTML compliance. But it's usually off by default because a whole lot of web pages won't work right. Because a whole lot of web pages don't use correctly formed HTML. They use loosely formed HTML. XML implies correctly formed tag-based language. Every opening tag must have a corresponding closing tag, so on and so forth. All right? So XML is a language for defining other languages, specifically data representation languages. And it does this in a tag-based way. So XML was inspired by HTML. You know, somebody looked at the HTML language and said, oh, you know what? The way we're representing web pages seems reasonable enough, and I bet you we can represent other things in that same way. It doesn't have to be web pages. We can represent patient records or information about baseball cards, all sorts of things we could represent with a language that looks like HTML. So... XML allows us to define languages that look like HTML, including HTML itself. Make sense? All right. Now, having said that, you mentioned that the web server could send XML to a web browser. What happens if a web browser receives XML? What does it do with it? If I fed a web page, so I just, let's say I had a big XML document on my, uh, my, my desktop, 
and I went into Chrome or whatever, pick your favorite browser, and did file, open, went to the desktop, opened up my sumfile.xml. And I'm promising you there's actual XML data in there. What would it look like inside the browser? Look the same. They might have some color coding, right? Yeah, they might color code the tags. Opening and closing tags might be a different color, that kind of stuff. But let's do the same thing. Why? Is the uh, web browser essentially an XML parser? Well, it's an HTML parser. So it's looking for opening and closing tags, right? But it only recognizes some opening and closing tags, specifically the opening and closing tags that are part of the HTML language, definition of the HTML language, right? So current one is HTML, what, 5.0 point whatever the current revision is. Um, that's what your modern day web browsers will, will recognize. But it'll look for opening tags and it'll look for closing tags. And when it sees them and says, I don't know what to do with this, it just spits them back out. Here's your tag. <laughs> Here's what you gave me. So, with that in mind, we could just say text here then too, right? If you have a uh, text file sitting on your desktop, it just says hello world in it. No formatting, no HTML around it, just, just literally just the word, you know, the couple of words, hello world. And you opened it up in your web browser, just show hello world in the web browser, right? Web browser is going to open that and say, okay, I don't know what to do with it, so I'll just show it to you. <laughs> this is what I read in. It'll just spit it back out the screen because it has nothing to do with it. All right? So these are all things that we could say are acceptable for a web browser to receive. But realistically, if a web server wants to be constructive, specifically if a web server wants to be constructive, if it's serving data to a web browser. Okay, I suspect he might be getting a little ahead of us here because XML makes perfect sense if the recipient isn't necessarily a web browser. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if right now we're talking about web browsers being our client side, we can expect everything that the web server gives us to be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Make sense? Just to throw a couple of buzzwords out here. This would be front end. Or client side. Synonyms. Both mean the same thing. This would be back end. Or server side. So if somebody you're applying for a job on for back-end development or server side development, they mean the same thing. It means you're writing programs that live over on this side of the equation. That means you're writing programs whose output looks like that. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, if your recipient, if your client is a web browser. But now in our application here, we have two different kinds of clients, don't we? We have web browsers and what else? An iPhone. This guy. All right, so can an iPhone talk to a web server? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the language that web servers speak is called the HTTP protocol. If you, I think I probably said that over here, like I said HTTP here. Hypertext Transport Protocol is what it stands for. Doesn't matter what it stands for. It's the language that web servers speak. Just like you and, you know, you and I are speaking English right now. Okay, if I was talking to a web server, we'd be speaking HTTP. 
whatever that is, some freaky deaky language. Okay? So, <coughs> certainly an iPhone could choose to talk to a web server using HTTP. Would a web server, if it was talking to an iPhone, have to deliver HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? Or could it choose to deliver other kinds of content? For example, it could send XML. It's not relying on the iPhone only knowing how to handle HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Instead, what's it doing? It's saying, well, the iPhone's obviously asking me for some data. Maybe it's asking me for the uh, um, current list of rides, or uh, current list of rides, that would be Uber, current list of jobs that are available for me to accept, something like that. It has to represent that stuff in some way. We have to structure it so that the iPhone can receive this, for example, XML, parse it and pull out those, those individual uh, uh, jobs to display on the screen somehow. Okay. What's nice for us is that is not predefined for us. The web browser is already defined it. It says, look, I speak HTML. If you want something to show up on the screen, send it to me in HTML <laughs> because that's what I know how to process. Okay, we're, we're in a different boat with our iPhone. So that server then has more options what it can send out. Okay. So let's, uh, well, we'll leave it up there for right now. All right, so do we understand what XML is? So XML is a tool for defining languages. So for example, we could use XML to define a language representation for our list of jobs that are available to accept. And put it in XML format. Similarly, a competitor, JSON, this is another language for defining languages. So, like XML, just less verbose, and it supports arrays. So I think we could probably comfortably say that JSON is better than XML. They didn't come out at the same time. XML has been out for a long time. JSON is much newer. Okay. But they're, they both solve the same problem. They allow us to organize data in a way that we can pull information out later on. Okay? That's the problem those tools are solving for us. Okay. So let me stick with our web discussion here for a few minutes. What's the JavaScript stuff for? What do we need JavaScript? We already got HTML and CSS. What's CSS? Let's, let's just get that over with real quick. Okay, so it's it's uh, actually it's XML based. Okay, so it's a uh, it's an XML based language for describing standard um, look and feel across a website. Just leave it at that. All right. So HTML and CSS in this argument are all about how does the web page look. Okay. So what's the JavaScript part? Okay. Dynamic stuff. Because HTML is not a programming language. HTML is a data representation language. We, we can't remember things, we can't ask questions, we can't write loops, we can't do any programming stuff with HTML. Right, so might we be interested in having some dynamic stuff happening on the web browser, on the front end, on the client side? Sure, have you ever been on a web page where something changed on the web page without the web page reloading? That's happened today, often, right? That's something we rely on. That's not HTML doing that. 
That's something else. Some sort of programming language is making dynamic decisions like that. Okay, so that's what JavaScript is. JavaScript is our front-end dynamic programming language. All right, so we look at this model here. Anything that's going to happen on these web interfaces here, anything that happens there, that happens dynamically without having to make a request back to the server, is going to have to happen in, the terms, in, in terms of JavaScript at some level. We'll talk about some different JavaScript technologies, but it'll happen in terms of JavaScript at some level because that is the dynamic programming language that web browsers understand, is JavaScript. Okay? All right. So over here, we have this big gray area. Okay, there's something has to happen back here because... Okay, the web server is like the person at the register at McDonald's. So we walk up and place our order, and they never break eye contact with you, but all of a sudden a Big Mac shows up. And you know they didn't make it. Okay, so something else is happening in the kitchen that ultimately is delivering the output that they're going to deliver to you, right? Okay? So we need to think about what's actually going down in the kitchen over here in order to, to solve this problem. Okay. So, we have some different technologies uh, that we might have available to us over here. Let's just start making a list. Any one of these technologies are ultimately going to produce HTML, CSS, and JavaScript when we're outputting to the web browser. So actually, let's, uh, well, we'll do it out here, I guess. Okay, could be PHP, could be Ruby, could be Python. What else? Could it be Java? Could this be a Java program back here? Possibly. Yeah. Could this be C++? Get back to older internet here. So back in the old days, it could be C, it could be C++. Uh, <laughs> they're doing it today to keep it alive. It could be COBOL. IBM has a product called WebSphere that turns allows you to process web forms with COBOL. So you certainly could be using COBOL to process web pages. Okay, but realistically speaking, our popular modern languages that are going to be in the website are going to be PHP, Ruby, Python. Java's kind of fallen out of vogue. If you're doing uh, uh, .NET programming, you might have C Sharp in here. It's fair to keep that as a modern language, but that, if you decide you're doing C-sharp, then you're also dictating what kind of animal this guy is. You're saying that my web server just became an Internet, Inf Internet Information Server, IIS, which is a Microsoft web browser. The second you say you're going to choose to use Microsoft uh, technology for it, that's fine, but you just locked yourself into a whole lot of Microsoft technology. Your database now is Microsoft, everything's going to be Microsoft. Okay. So we could probably take C sharp off there. So that means our back end for the web is going to be PHP, Ruby, Python. Anything else you want to put on here? Node.js.
Now, most of us have probably heard of all those at some point. Whether we really know what they are or could articulate anything about them is a whole different thing, but we've seen the buzzword or it popped up on some web page somewhere or at some point you were looking at uh, online programming tutorials and you saw some of these things pop up, right? Okay, so they're out there. Do we know what the difference is? So we're gonna, we're a startup company, we're gonna have to make a decision. Which of these we're gonna use and why? This is part of that brainstorming process. So we need to deal with each of these in turn in order to make this decision. Which backend tech? So we have PHP, we have Ruby, we have Python, and we have Node.js. All right, tell me, what do we know about PHP? First of all, are all of these programming languages? Or, or maybe the, the fairest way of saying it, are all of these uh, programming languages or some flavor of what are typically referred to as web frameworks? All right, I'm actually gonna write these a little bit differently. All right, I'm gonna say PHP on Apache. I'm gonna say Ruby on Rails. We're gonna say Python on Flask. And we're gonna say, instead of Node.js, we're gonna say JavaScript on Node. This is the web server. That's the HTTP component. This is the web server. This is the web server. This is the web server. Uh, actually, the web server on Node is called Express, but just let this slide. This is the language. This is the language. This is the language. This is the language. Okay, so as I have it written here, we would reference these as all as being what are called web frameworks. So that is the coupling between a language, a web-based language, and an HTTP compliant server. Something that can that ultimately has the ability to spit stuff back out to a client who's interested in catching it. So these web technologies, these web frameworks, have built-in webs, well, have a web server, whether it's built-in or not is, is up for grabs in some of these te technologies. But ultimately, there's a web server involved that will run that program that you wrote in the language of your choosing and will then spit out the output of that program, which will be in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Make sense? All right, so we have four options here. Four options. So, how many of you have heard of Apache before? Okay, one person, what's Apache? Well, I already said it's a web server, but tell, tell me about it as far as a web server. Is it new? Is it old? Is it good? Is it bad? What do we know about it? Okay. 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 So we could probably say Apache is probably the industry standard for enterprise level web servers. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because it's the it's because it's the standard. Yeah. A Apache is huge. It's uh, uh today probably about fifty percent of the web is Apache based. The other fifty percent is IIS. And those numbers might be moved a couple direction, you know, percentage points either direction. But, you know, Apache represents about half of the Internet in terms of uh, web traffic. Okay, so it's a web server. So it's this guy in that picture. That's Apache. All right. So we're going to say Apache is really, really, really good. Enterprise strong, can handle zillions and zillions of hits per second. No harm, no foul. Um, but it's been around for a while. If 
you're running an Apache server, chances are you're probably writing PHP code, which is also an older language. Nothing wrong with it. Super popular language. How many of you have heard of, how many of you have heard of PHP? Okay. What can you tell me about PHP? Good? Bad? I already said it's kind of old. Do people still use PHP today? Sure. What's good about it? What's bad about it? What do we know? As far as web languages go, do you know what's the advantage of PHP? Well, it was a language specifically built for the web. Okay. So uh, you would find it is very, very, very rare to find somebody who writes anything other than web programs using PHP. I don't think you're going to find somebody who's going to be writing front-end applications using PHP. The language isn't conducive to that. Not that you couldn't, okay? But PHP very strongly leans towards web page stuff. There's a lot of built-in things in PHP uh, that make doing web webby stuff easier. Okay? At the same time, uh, PHP is also widely supported. So whenever you're looking at third-party APIs or, or, or things like that, and things we'll talk about, uh, it's highly likely that they will have a PHP implementation of their API because PHP is, is very, very popular. Okay? So really what we're looking at here, if we were to summarize this line, we would say um, old and stable high performance server with old and very web centric language. That's what we could say right there. So, web server, nothing wrong with it. Language, nothing wrong with it. Key word here for us though is that it's very web-centric. And in our application, we're dealing with a little bit more than just web. Okay. Oh, here we'll talk about some of you have seen this before as well, but we'll talk about this when we come back. <clears throat> Just pick up there's a. So I'm going to also say uh, no MVC. Okay, so any questions about anything we've talked about up to this point? All right, so let's take about 15 minutes. We'll come back at uh, like 8.15 or so. Uh, so take a walk, get a drink, go to the bathroom, whatever you got to do. Uh, I, I record all the lectures, in case you didn't notice. So uh, I'll stop the recording and I'll upload it to YouTube and then I'll record the second half. So each, each week we'll have two separate lectures.